Hello, welcome to the Kavli Foundation's live interview with two astronomers who were involved recently with the discovery of a huge galaxy cluster in the distant universe. It's called Phoenix, and the central galaxy in this cluster is producing stars at really an unheard of rate, faster than any other cluster seen in the universe. The question, of course, is why? Uh, why is the Phoenix cluster different from other clusters? Today, we have Michael McDonald, a Hubble Fellow at the MIT Kavli Institute for Astrophysics and Space Research in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He was the lead author of a paper that appeared in the journal Nature on August 15th. We also have Bradford Benson, a Fellow at the Kavli Institute for Cosmological Physics at the University of Chicago. He was a co-author on the paper that appeared in Nature. Mike and Brad, thank you for joining us. And my name is Bruce Lieberman. Over the next 30 minutes, I'll be asking questions about their study and their next steps, and we'll also be taking questions from the public. I'd like to begin, however, with a few basic questions. Uh, Mike, I'd love to ask you, um, basically, what is a galaxy cluster, and uh, why are they so important for studying uh, the universe? Uh, thanks, Bruce. Um, so a galaxy cluster is um, just a collection of hundreds to thousands of galaxies. Um, so galaxies like our Milky Way, uh, but rather than being in relative isolation, they're um, in, in this family or in this grouping of galaxies that, that contain uh, hundreds to thousands, uh, sometimes more. So, um, And they're all bound by gravity, just like stars in our Milky Way are bound to the Milky Way. These galaxies are bound to the cluster. Yeah, okay. and, and, and all these galaxies have a central, uh, the galaxy clusters, excuse me, have a central galaxy that's the largest and the oldest, is that right? And, and most galaxies that have been observed, uh, these central galaxies are really quite, kind of quiescent and dormant, is that right? Right. I mean, the, the picture is that you generally have um, the central galaxy that kind of sits in the middle of the cluster, and it's kind of like the anchor for the cluster. Everything sort of um, goes around that, essentially. And it's, um, I mean, it probably formed first, or it was one of the first galaxies in the cluster to form. And it sort of drew in these um, additional galaxies to build up the cluster. So it's um, sort of by definition, it should be almost the oldest thing in the cluster and, and the most massive because it's had the most time to grow. So the typical picture is this exceptionally massive, very old galaxy sitting in the middle of the cluster. Uh, but in Phoenix, you have sort of the same thing, an exceptionally massive, um, probably very old galaxy in the very center. Uh, but for some reason, it's essentially come back to life. You have a, a tremendous amount of new stars being formed. Uh, every day in the core of the cluster. Now I'd like to come back to why you think um, what you think is happening in the core galaxy of Phoenix, but uh, Brad, first tell us about how uh, Phoenix was discovered. I understand it was discovered uh, during a survey by a telescope at the South Pole, is that right? That's right. So we, we found the Phoenix cluster with the South Pole Telescope, which is a microwave telescope located at the geographic South Pole in Antarctica. And we discovered it in a really unique, unique way. So galaxy clusters are one of the few things in the universe uh, that are so big uh, that they distort, the, they make shadows in the light from the Big Bang. So uh, when we look out into the sky, telescopes are sort of like time machines. We're seeing the universe as it appeared in the past, a long ago. You know, the sun takes about eight minutes for light to travel to us. As you look out farther and farther, you're seeing things they were older in the past. So it turns out if you look far enough back and in the right way in microwaves, you can see this leftover light uh, from the Big Bang, and it, that light is brightest in microwaves now. Basically, if you had microwave eyes, the entire sky would be glowing with microwaves. Um, and since the universe is so empty, uh, it, that light's relatively traveled, you know, uh, un, unchanged to us. It's traveled for 14 billion years across the entire zero universe. While galaxy clusters are one of the few things that are so massive that are dense enough that as this light, the Big Bang, passes through them, they create these shadows. And it turns out that's a very effective way to find the most massive, distant clusters of galaxies in the universe because it's traveled across the entire observable universe to get to us, this light from the Big Bang. And so this was, uh, the Phoenix Cluster was found by the SBT using this method. Uh, doing by this, the South Pole Telescope? By the South Pole Telescope. Mm -hmm. uh, doing this method on about one fifteenth of the sky. So... Uh, you know, this is, you know, and this, this technique to finding galaxy clusters only demonstrated about four years ago. It was predicted in the 70s, and only recently have we developed the 
the microwave detector technology is sensitive enough to actually use this technique to find clusters. And so this was part of this survey that was recently just you know demonstrated four years ago, and, and the survey was just completed last year. So um, uh, once you discovered this cluster, and, and Phoenix isn't the only one, you've discovered others uh, with yeah. this survey, I would imagine. But yeah. after you discovered Phoenix, um, uh, what gave you a clue, and either Mike or Brad, uh, what gave you a clue that you wanted to look at it more closely? Uh, well, I'll, I'll start and then Mike continue. Uh, so, uh, so you know, it's, uh, we're, we know we're interested in these clusters for many reasons. You know, one, uh, we're trying to use them to uh, understand cosmology, which is, uh, you know, a topic we can talk more, more later. But, you know, as part of that, we're, we try to, f they're also very interesting because they're the most massive clusters in the universe. So we want to learn more about them. And there's a very large uh, program that we have looking at these clusters in many different ways, using different wavelengths of lights, optical, uh, X-ray, ex infrared, etc. And so as part of that, uh, you know, we started this large program following up many of these clusters discovered by the South Pole Telescope uh, with Chandra, which is an X-ray uh, sensitive satellite. Because this, uh, this gas in the cluster that creates the shadow also emits brightly in the X-rays. It's extremely hot on the order of 100 million degrees uh, uh, temperature, so it's hotter than the interior of the sun. And so these clusters are, are literally the, the brightest X-ray sources in the sky. They, they stand out everywhere. Um, and so uh, as part of our, our follow-up to learn more about these clusters of galaxies, how they form, we first observed it. One of the first things we did was observe it with the, the Chandra X-ray Observatory to see this hot gas and, and learn more. This is a space-based telescope. Yeah, this is, a, this is this, a X-ray sensitive space-based telescope. And, you know, immediately one of the first things that stood out from that was just that, that this cluster was... Uh, the most X-ray luminous cluster ever discovered. So, we've been doing surveys for these things in optical and X-ray for you know decades, and this Phoenix cluster turned out to be the brightest uh, X-ray cluster. Now, in the sky. What does that What does that indicate to an uh, an astronomer when it's the most luminous X-ray emitting cluster that you've seen? What does that mean for the general public? Well, so, it, it, oh, well yeah, you can go ahead, Mike. Okay, so the. <laughs> I mean, the, the reason it's bright is because it's cooling. So just like, I mean, we're giving off infrared radiation because we're uh, whatever temperature your skin is. But the, the galaxy cluster is 100 million degrees. And so it's, giving, it's cooling via x-rays. Okay. And so, um, so the fact that we can see it indicates that it's the gas, the 100 million degree gas is actually cooling very rapidly. And so being the most luminous cluster in the universe um, implies that it's also cooling faster than any other cluster we've ever discovered. So it's now it's, this it's is this is oh, I'm sorry. This is gas in the cluster that's flowing toward the central galaxy. Is that right? Well so yeah this, I mean the gas just fills the whole cluster and it's it's between been between the galaxies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's sort of um, like uh, water and the galaxies are the fish, right? So mm -hmm. um, so you're you're filling the whole cluster with this gas and the cooler gas will sink towards the middle because it's more dense. Um, and so you can get this flow of cool gas towards the center. And the closer to the center it is, the faster it cools. And so it's kind of a runaway effect. And so, so in the core of the Phoenix Cluster, the gas is cooling exceptionally fast. It's cooling 4,000 suns worth of cold gas every year. So uh, very, oh, wow. very fast. Yeah. Now, you uh, the, the core galaxy of of a galaxy cluster is going to appear, if it if it's, uh, has older stars, it's going to appear more red. Uh, and, and Phoenix actually looked more blue optically. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So that was sort of the telltale sign that it was, it was interesting. Um, so the, the idea was that, uh, as Brad said, we saw right away that this was very, very luminous, which implies it's cooling very rapidly, which implies uh, to an astronomer that there should be stars forming because the fuel for stars is cold gas. So the more mm -hmm. cold gas you have, the more stars you should have. So we immediately looked, um, looked for signs of these young stars, and the, the, the telltale sign is blue or ultraviolet light because um, the younger stars are, are hotter, and they're, which means they're bluer. Okay. okay. I, I just want to um, uh, ask one more question, and then we're going to go to uh, questions we have from the public. Uh, so... Uh, you uh, studied this galaxy using many different telescopes, including Chandra, looking at the X-ray emissions, and you were able to calculate, uh, after all these measurements, you were able to calculate a star formation rate. 
That is how fast the central galaxy in this cluster was producing stars. Right. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And it was uh, 740 stars, about that many per That's year. Right. Is that correct? Right. Now, to, to, to me, and I think to a lot of people, that might not seem like a lot, considering how, how large a, a galaxy is. But, but for you, for astronomers, um, that, is a, that is a lot of stars to produce for a galaxy in, in one year. Why is that? Right. So, I mean, for, for context, I mean, the Milky Way is forming about one new star per year. Um, and the Milky Way is considered um, not old. It's a young galaxy that's actively forming stars. So one star per year is pretty reasonable. Just uh, one star per year. That's, incre that's incredible. Right. And so a typical cluster central galaxy, as I said, they're very old. So the typical number is about zero. The, they're done forming stars. The most extreme systems that we know of are forming maybe 10 to 50 stars per year. And the single most extreme prior to Phoenix was 150 stars per year. So, um, so I mean, this sort of range between um, 0 and 10 is sort of normal. 10 to 50 is uh, abnormal. And 150 was very, very extreme and abnormal. And then now Phoenix is 750. So you see it's kind of off the charts uh, for, for the so type. The, of so these central galaxies that are typically much older than the surrounding galaxies, if they're not producing more stars, at least the other ones that we've seen, uh, how do they grow? They, they grow by having other galaxies merge with them. Is that right? Right. Yeah. I mean, that, that's the current picture is that um, these very, very massive stars, I mean, they, they formed some of their own stars uh, very early in the universe to get their initial mass. But since then, they've been growing by, um, by feeding off the smaller galaxies in the cluster. So they're in the center of the cluster. And so the odds of them interacting with another galaxy are high. And so they, they, um, they feed off these galaxies and grow by, by merging with the galaxies. Um, okay. But, but here's, a, here's a galaxy... Um, that, that doesn't seem to need to grow that way. Um, I mean, it'll, at seven, only 740 new stars per year seems small, but in, in 100 million years, that's going to double the total mass of the galaxy. Um, and this galaxy is 50 times the mass of the Milky Way, so doubling that much mass in a cosmic blink of an eye is, uh, is pretty extreme. So, um, so th this galaxy doesn't need to grow by mergers. It could, it could become the most massive galaxy in the universe just by this high star formation rate. Well, let's come back and talk about what's powering that star formation rate in a minute. But I'd like to get some, to some questions from the public. And we have a question that was emailed in for Brad, um, I think it would be appropriate. And uh, it's kind of a basic question, but an interesting one. Why, why is the South Pole Telescope at the South Pole? I mean, what, why put a telescope there? <laughs> oh, that's, good. that's a good question. So uh, we're, we're, with the South Pole Telescope, we're trying to look at the light left over from the Big Bang, which is brightest in microwaves right now. Uh, so the South Pole is a unique spot for microwave observations because it's, number one, it's pretty high. It's about, 11, it's about a little over 10,000 feet high. It's on a two-mile thick ice sheet. Uh, but then number two, what really makes it special is that it's so dry. You know, when the air is that cold, you know, it literally just cannot hold much water. So it turns out the South Pole is, uh, you know, one of, if not the driest place on Earth, much drier than, you know, uh, the the, the in, a desert in Chile on a mountaintop, much drier than any other desert you can imagine. It's, it actually is technically a desert at the South Pole because it never snows there. There's very little water vapor. And water vapor is important for microwaves uh, because uh, my, uh, water absorbs microwaves, just like a microwave oven works by absorbing microwaves and heating up uh, your food. The same thing applies to the air. Water is very uh, damaging for microwaves. It absorbs uh, all the microwaves from the sky. And so... Uh, the South Pole is so dry that it's literally the best place for, for microwave observations. So that, so that means these photons are going to be traveling for billions of years across the universe, uh, yeah. unobstructed for the most part, and yeah. uh, only to end that journey in the upper atmosphere and be absorbed by a water molecule, and then it's right. done. And you can never see it from the ground. And that, that's why having a dry, high telescope site is so critical for you, and, and the, the South Pole is a great spot. It, yeah, it's cold, cool. but it's really <laughs> it's a good spot for astronomy. Well, yeah. um, we have another email question, um, and uh, our listener says that it's still unclear what a what a galaxy cluster is. And so, uh, is it a bunch of galaxies together? Uh, does it make galaxies? Um, what would let's see? What would it look like? Yeah, what would a galaxy look like if you were in outer space and could see it? <laughs> 
So those are kind of a bunch of questions. So I guess this person was unclear on what galaxy clusters are, how they form, and right. what they I mean, look so, like if you were out there. So a galaxy cluster is sort of just like, uh, I mean, for example, I mean, in our solar system, you have a bunch of planets that are bound by gravity. And that, that makes up a solar system is these, these bunches of planets. Um, in the galaxy, we have bunches of stars that are held by gravity, and that makes up a galaxy, is this gravitationally bound collection of stars. And then okay. just going one step bigger, a galaxy cluster is just uh, an assembly of, of galaxies, each made of billions of stars, but an assembly of galaxies that are all bound together and have a common sort of motion. They're all sort of rotating around the center of the cluster. And so it's sort of just building up from, from planets around a star to stars around a galaxy to galaxies around a galaxy cluster. Right. And the biggest galaxy clusters will be something like a, a few thousand galaxies all bound together. A few thousand. So that's, that's pretty massive. That's, that's pretty massive. Right. And, right. uh, okay. Um, uh, so, uh, this other question I have here, uh, that was emailed in gets to, um, what we were going to get back to, and that's what's powering this star formation. Um, now, uh, galaxy clusters that have been observed, uh, which, uh, before Phoenix have a black hole in the center of, of the central galaxy that gives off a lot of energy and that energy tends to, as I understand it, that energy tends to prevent stars, prevent gas from collapsing and gravitationally coalescing and stars forming. But right. in Phoenix, it has a central black hole, but that black hole is doing something different than the one that we've seen in other clusters. Um, right. Mike, tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, so the, the, uh, the idea is that, I mean, the cluster is this... Um, vast reservoir of 100 million degree gas, but, but left out, it should cool. I mean, just like your cup of coffee, if you leave it on the counter, it's going to cool eventually and become cold. The same should happen to that gas in the cluster. But in, in every other cluster we've looked at, um, there's this central heat source. The central supermassive black hole has these radio jets that are heating the cluster. And so it's sort of like you, you've now put your cup of coffee on, on a hot plate. And so, sure, it's cooling, but the hot plate is also keeping it uh, keeping at this constant temperature. So it's giving off heat to the air, but then it's gaining heat from the hot plate. And so that's sort of what's happening in a typical cluster is the, the gas is cooling by this X-ray radiation, but it's also heat, heated by exactly the same amount roughly, well, exactly roughly, um, by, mm -hmm. by the central supermassive black hole. So you have this sort of nice uh, coupling of, of the cooling and the heating so that they balance out. Now, the Phoenix Cluster, for some reason, um, maybe the hot plate blew a fuse or something, but um, it, it's not as hot as it should be. So, um, so it's cooling by some enormous factor, and it's only being heated by about a quarter of that energy. Um, so this sort of difference um, in energy balance, is, is the result is this runaway cooling. And so the central supermassive black hole isn't producing enough heat or isn't producing sort of powerful enough radio jets uh, to offset the cooling and to um, prevent this uh, runaway cooling from happening. So it's kind of a fight between the gravitational forces that are bringing the gas toward the central galaxy and causing cooling and and gravitational um, collapse and, and energy coming out from the center, which is pushing all that away. Right. Uh, against essentially, yeah. It's, 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 this, it's this battle between the cooling gas and the, the heating of the black hole. And the gas wants to be cool, and the black hole doesn't want it to be cool. <laughs> so they're mm -hmm. sort of uh, fighting. And, and in, in every cluster we've looked at, essentially, this is a tie. I mean, the, the black hole is putting almost the exact right amount of energy back into the system to keep it warm. Okay. Well, it, Mike or Brad, either of you can – I'm sorry, did you want to say no, something else? Go ahead. Mike or Brad, either of you can take this question, and it, it, again, it's kind of a defining terms. Um, we had a question from a, a listener asking, um, you know, basically what a black hole is. You know, what, what happens first? Uh, how does a galaxy form, and then what comes first, stars or a black hole? Um, so if you can kind of – Brad, maybe Brad or, or Mike, if you can kind of explain that just on a very basic, brief level. Mike, do you want to take this? Or? Sure, I'll take that. I mean, so a black hole is kind of the um, end product of a, of a massive star. So if you form a, a very massive star um, and it goes supernova, 
when it dies, what's left, the remains, is a black hole or, or a neutron star. But if it's massive enough, it'll, it'll turn into a black hole. Um, uh, so that's what we call like a stellar mass black hole um, because it came from a single star. But in the centers of galaxies, like, like our own Milky Way, there's what we call a supermassive black hole that is millions of times more massive than a single star. And so these are, um, they're sitting in the centers of, of all galaxies, essentially, um, and they're just sort of feeding off um, stars and gas in the center of the, of the galaxy. Um, and so this Phoenix cluster, like, like every other galaxy, the central galaxy in the cluster has uh, a very, very massive black hole um, that's feeding off some of this cooling gas and it's producing these jets. I don't know if that answers so, <laughs> it, it does. Thanks. Uh, so, um, question from a, a listener, another question, uh, and that has to do with um, kind of the big picture of this study. What, what does uh, what you've learned about the Phoenix Cluster, what, can, can you draw any conclusions or any, any, can you speculate about what this says about how cl clusters evolve in the universe how, and, and how the universe itself, large-scale structure in the universe evolves? Or is it too early to really draw any conclusions? Right, so maybe I'll take the galaxy evolution part of that and Brad can talk about right. the cosmo cosmological implications. Uh, right. But So, I mean, from a galaxy perspective, um, the fact that this central galaxy, we've sort of caught it in the act of forming um, so many stars, um, it, if it's not unique, then that, that means that this is how, this is a way that uh, these central gal galaxies can build up. So these are the central galaxy and the cluster are the most massive galaxies in the universe. They're this very massive population, and it's always been thought that they grew via mergers. They grow by eating up the smaller galaxies in the cluster. Uh, but here's one that doesn't need to do that, 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 can, that can grow by forming its own stars. And this, this tells us um, a lot about how, um, how these most massive galaxies assembled. If, if, every, if every cluster went through a very brief phase like this, it only has to last 1% of the lifetime of the cluster to, to double the mass of the central galaxy. So... Um, it's a blink of an eye, but it's it's a very important process, and it might be how these most massive galaxies get so massive and sort of um, become the dominant galaxy in the cluster. So it's very interesting from a galaxy evolution perspective and from a star formation perspective because um, every every galaxy goes through this process where it's accreting the the hot gas is cooling and falling onto the galaxy. Our own Milky Way is doing this, but it's doing it at maybe one one hundredth of the percent efficiency <laughs> so it's uh, it's an important process and it's it's best to study things like this in the most extreme cases where the, the everything's so bright and you can really get the data and then apply it to the less extreme systems so so one idea is that is that the Phoenix cluster is not such an anomaly it's not so different from other clusters it's just that you've caught this cluster at a certain stage in its in its evolution that you right. haven't seen before in other clusters. Right. I mean, so if every cluster goes through this phase, we'd only expect to see it 1% um, of the time. Even if it happened in 100% of clusters, it can only last for about 100 million years, and the universe is over 10 billion years old. So catching, catching this, this type of thing happening, uh, um, it, it's, it's not too surprising that we haven't seen it in too many other clusters. Um, and especially if it's something that happens predominantly in the early universe, where, as Brad said, we've only started looking at these clusters for the last four years. So um, there's a lot of unknown stuff about these sort of clusters at early times. And maybe this is a phase they all go through. And once we study more than a couple hundred of these clusters, we'll start to build up a sample of these things. So, right. so Brad, we've been talking about some, some awfully big things. Let's talk about some even bigger things. Now, you know, there's this mysterious force that's causing the universe to expand at an ever faster rate, the so-called dark energy. Um, right. Is there anything about this study, about the evolution of galaxy clusters that can help us understand the behavior of that? Right. Well, that, that was the, the original motivation for the South Pole Telescope, is to ultimately use clusters of galaxies to learn about dark energy. So you know, clusters are also important in a cosmological sense because since they are the largest, most massive uh, gravitationally bound objects in the universe, they're also really important for understanding 
uh, the structure formation of the universe, how those clusters have formed over time and, and grown over time. And so you can imagine, you know, what we're trying to do in this uh, broader cosmological sense is, you know, when we look at the, the light from the Big Bang, we can you know, we see the universe as it was before stars and galaxies formed when the universe was just all hot gas. And then we know if we fast forward 14 billion years, uh, that all that featureless uh, gas that we see had to turn into stars and galaxies, clusters of galaxies uh, that, that we see around us today. So we're trying to just connect those two endpoints. How, how we get a universe that has no stars and galaxies and, uh, to turn into this thing that we see around us today. And clusters are important because, you know, they're, they're so massive that they uh, have come together from uh, size patches of the universe, uh, millions of light years across, mm -hmm. and they take a long time to form. They form by growing and merging with other clusters, other galaxies coming together. So h how many of them form in the universe is a very sensitive measure of both the content of the universe and how, how long, how much time they've had to form. And it turns out dark energy is a very important uh, 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 factor in that. Dark energy is uh, the thing that is responsible for this uh, accelerated expansion of the universe that we see. You know, we know the universe is expanding from the Big Bang, uh, but strangely, it seems to be accelerating faster at the time. So you'd think, at, given a certain amount of time, gravity would start keeping pulling things back together, uh, but it, that's not what we observe. It seems to be moving faster and faster apart the longer time goes on. And we think dark energy is doing this. Well, uh, so, you know, if, if that was the case, then we should see the effect of dark energy and the amount of clusters of galaxies that form. Because uh, if dark, you know, if dark energy wasn't there, the clusters might have more time to, to form. And we'd see more of them uh, as we look back in time. So, uh you know, so by studying the behavior of clusters and the evolution of clusters, what they're doing at different points in cosmic history, you yeah. can learn indirectly about the behavior and evolution of dark energy. Is that yeah, right? So, yeah, right, exactly. And so part of the follow-up is trying to, since we want to use clusters of galaxies as these cosmological tools to learn about dark energy, you know, it's very important we understand the details of what's going on inside them as well. The So that the how energy is being pumped into this gas that we're seeing, how, how that affects the evolution of these things. And so, you know, for something like the Phoenix Cluster, where we, it's really this game-changing event where we have this picture of this unique time in, in cluster formation that we've never seen before. And so that could be very important for us in trying to understand and interpret these measurements of how many of them have formed over time. Okay, um, so... Let's talk about your next steps. Uh, uh, Brad, you're involved in this uh, survey of uh, galaxy clusters, and I assume that you know both of you and your colleagues are interested in looking for more galaxy clusters because, of, of course, if you see this going on in one galaxy cluster, you want to see if it's going on in other galaxy clusters that you haven't yet observed. Is that right? That's right. So with, with the South Pole Telescope, uh, we've identified uh, hundreds, uh, about 500, clusters that, you know, aren't most of them are, aren't quite as big as the Phoenix cluster, obviously, but they're, they're similar in the sense that they're, they're also, uh, you know, within a factor of several, you know, or so of it, the mass of the Phoenix cluster, and, you know, there's similar age formation in the universe. So we found these things with the South Pole Telescope. We surveyed about, surveyed about 15th of the sky, uh, and now, you know, we want to try to observe as many of them as possible with, with X-ray optical observations. And uh, right now, Mike and I are uh, collaborating on a survey to observe about 100 of these uh, clusters identified by the South Pole Telescope with Chandra and, you know, ultimately start learning more and seeing if we can find any other uh, Phoenix-like clusters out there that, whether this is a, a brief uh, event that we just got extremely lucky finding or if uh, it is, you know, s some indication of some new epic and the cluster's history. Mike want to, might want to talk about that more. Sure. Right. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, uh, oh. if you can say that real briefly, and then I wanted to ask you about um, your plans to um, look at the Phoenix cluster cluster more closely, and then sure. we'll we'll wrap up at that point. Right. Um, so, so I mean, that that was what I was about to say is that there's sort of a, a two pronged approach here. There's what Brad said about looking for more systems like this and understanding how the Phoenix cluster fits in with, with all the other clusters. Uh, but then the other side is, is to look more closely at the Phoenix cluster and understand um, in more detail what exactly is going on.
Um, so, I mean, there, there are several outstanding questions. For example, why is the central supermassive black hole um, so inefficient at heating uh, the gas and preventing this runaway star formation? Um, so, so, so we have a number of, of projects that we're um, sort of just starting to get off the ground to study this in more detail. For example, um, using the ALMA telescope in Chile, uh, this is a radio, um, uh, a radio array of telescopes, and uh, we can look for the, the coldest gas in the universe. So the idea is that if, if this gas is cooling from 100 million degrees down to very cold before forming stars, we sh this, this thing should be extremely bright. Um, in cold gas. It should have a, a huge reservoir of cold gas. So um, for, that's something that we could, we could look for. And, and knowing how much cold gas there is tells us exactly how long the star formation can last. Just like if you know how much gas is in your, your tank in the car, you know how far you can drive before you run out of gas, right, if you assume mm -hmm. highway or whatever. Um, so, uh, so it's the same idea. If we know how much cold gas is there, instead of kind of just guessing that it's about 100 million years till this runs out, we can say exactly um, this star formation can only last for X number of years. So that'll be a really useful constraint. Um, the other side is to get a much, um, a much sharper image of the core of the cluster. So um, as you said earlier, the galaxy looked very blue um, in, the, in the images in the paper and in the press release, uh, but it's really just a blue fuzzy blob. And we don't really know how this star formation is proceeding, whether it's sort of a nuclear star burst or this sort of extended filamentary uh, stars forming out of the cooling uh, streams. So, so we've, we've just recently been granted a, um, a few orbits of Hubble time to get a very deep, um, clear picture of what's going on in this cluster and where these stars are coming from. And, and that'll actually let us um, more clearly separate the contribution from the central black hole from the contribution from the stars. That's terrific. So you'll be you using Hubble what in, in sometime in 2013? Yeah, yeah. Early 2013 is when we should be able to um, produce a very nice, pretty picture for everyone. So great. Well, we're a little bit over, but I wanted to get to maybe just one or two other questions from the public, and uh, one of them was interesting uh, to me, and that is, um, you know, when we look at our own Milky Way galaxy. Um, is the Milky Way part of a cluster, and do we know what the central galaxy in its cluster is? Do we right. know anything about that? I mean, so the Milky Way is part of what we call a, a group or a loose group, um, and so um, so it's not in complete isolation. There's the Milky Way, and then there's the Andromeda ga galaxy, which is, I mean, those two are the most massive galaxies, and they're almost equal mass. Mm -hmm. And then there's, uh, I think M33 is the third most massive, and then there's a lot of little ones. So there's, okay. there's maybe like 20 galaxies, um, sort of big enough that you would call them galaxies, in the Milky Way's group, and we call that the local group. Um, so it's not quite a cluster, it's, it's more of a right. group. I mean, so the, yeah, the difference is that, so Phoenix is about a thousand times more massive than the local group, right? So this group right. of galaxies that we belong to um, is one one thousandth of, of the Phoenix cluster. So, so it's a very different scale in terms of how how clustered and how uh, how many total galaxies there are, uh, but we're not in complete isolation. Most galaxies are actually in these little groups. So most galaxies are in little groups, and then there are these larger kind of um, convergence of, of galaxies that that form clusters. Right. Yeah, and I mean, so, so galaxies that galaxies organize them, themselves in many different ways. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's it's just gravity. So things are attracted to each other, and so. Um, we're attracted to Andromeda, and we're sort of making our own group, and then that's going to eventually fall into the Virgo cluster, I imagine. Um, so these groups fall into bigger groups, which fall into clusters, and everything, okay. they want to get together. So. so our local group is near, on cosmological scales, near a cluster of galaxies called the Virgo cluster. Right, right. Okay. All right. Um, uh, we always have many more questions than we can than we can do in the time allotted, but um, I think we went a little bit over, and I, I really do appreciate um, both of you coming and talking to us, and we're really looking forward to uh, checking in with you again after you've done your next studies, looking for more of these clusters, and uh, taking a look at Phoenix um, up close with, with uh, Hubble next year. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.